STEM Academy, and I got to know him this summer because I, I watched him with kids. And it was amazing the way that he was able, and his team were able to help kids understand science in a hands-on way and, and understand trial and error. Right, Eric? Yes. <laughs> and so, please help me welcome Eric Sneller. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Richards, for the honor of serving as this year's faculty speaker. And thank you, Mayor Reed, for your unfailing support of our students and our community. And thank you to members of the school board here today for your leading our division. And to the esteemed faculty of Harrisonburg City Public Schools, I thank you for saying yes to our division and yes to serving our students and community. Truly, you are at the core of their well-being. Your skill sets, passion, and vision continue to build our community up and make positive impacts that last a lifetime. Like many of you, I am the beneficiary of our division's commitment to educators. Through its support, I have been privileged to enjoy countless learning opportunities both for myself and for my students. Today, I'll be talking about cultivating what I call the 14,000-foot view. As it's been two years since we've all been in this space together, I recognize the immensity of this moment. Accordingly, I will draw on inspiration from three thought leaders in education, one world-renowned author, a former professor of mine, two former students from my first year, and some students from our summer STEM activities. You're currently looking at a lower altitude photo taken from our students' balloon research. They sent boxes that travel to 14,000 feet sharing a variety of experience. In the top left corner, you are looking at one student's gas law research and his marshmallow smiley face. <laughs> Love it. And the bottom left photo is from our campfire experience, which stands for fueling intrigue, research, and excitement. And I think I can speak for my colleagues in that our time with students relit our love of learning and teaching. Thus, I wanted to briefly share. In the Spanish language, what do you do for a living is often asked as, a que te dedicas? What do you dedicate yourself to? What do you dedicate yourself to? In education, this question may be more salient than ever before. As educators, we know that teaching is more than just a job, it is a vocation. In the endeavor toward a more perfect union, our calling is of the highest order challenge helping to raise the youth of our nation. For myself, contributing to this cause compels me to consistently reflect on my passion for learning, my five specific goals for students, and my sphere of influence. In order to rise up to that challenge, I take courage from my family. On the left, you're looking at a photo of my mother's grandparents and their grocery store in Los Angeles. Well, they ran the store, my grandfather, Fernando, shines shoes on the streets of LA, contributing to the family's finances. This photo on the left was taken shortly before the Great Depression forced them to shutter their business. My great-grandparents emigrated from northern Mexico to the United States so that Fernando could be born on US soil and gain citizenship. Fernando went on to fly B-17 and B-24 bombers in World War II. He was shot down over Denmark on Easter Sunday, 1944, and spent one year in a G German prisoner of war camp. I just realized my mask is so long. <laughs> Miraculously, <laughs> there we go. Pardon me. Miraculously, he returned to have seven children with Julia and practiced medicine for over 50 years. In trying times as these, the ones that we are facing, my family's legacy is my lighthouse. I also draw strength from the teachers of my youth, those whose steadfast love of learning brought out the best in me. 
people like Dr. Lee Burns. After I grew up on a corn and soybean farm in a small Iowa town, I entered Iowa State University. In my third semester, I met Dr. Burris. On the first day of Introduction to Soils, he strode into the auditorium of Agronomy Hall, wrote the agenda on the chalkboard, took several deep gulps of his iconic Diet Pepsi, and began the class. After asking everyone to share their names and where they saw themselves in five years, Dr. Burris focused the class's attention. He asked, is Iowa doing its job to feed the world? Sitting in the front row that first day of class, I felt my mind sink into the gravity of this question. I thought, is Iowa doing its job to feed the world? How in the world would I know? How does one even begin to answer that? I also recall feeling frustrated. How could someone like me, a fourth continuous generation to grow up on a farm, not have a solid answer to a question about corn and soybeans? In the course of that semester, I learned that reasoned, logical answers to his query demanded not only new technical knowledge, but also a new style of thought. As his students, many of us began to think ecologically for the first time in our lives. Dr. Burris challenged us to consider how complex issues in the world, such as food production and distribution, are only understood in terms of dynamic, worldwide interlocking factors. In essence, Dr. Burris, who later became my advisor, taught me to be reflective, curious, and collaborative. His ideas stuck with me and helped inspire my choosing the teaching field. Fast forward to today, and those lessons still reverberate. We who teach have immense power. Every class session we lead has the potential to help students tap into their personal greatness. Through the lens of the highly insightful educator and Quaker elder, Dr. Parker Palmer, Student success is predicated upon what he describes as a community of truth. In a community of truth, all members are regarded as essential because they have knowledge the community needs to hear. In a community of truth, not knowers are connected to one another and all are situated around the subject. Like a warm bonfire, people would gather around a great topic of study. Speaking of roots, in my world of environmental science and chemistry, I used a personal trip to Yellowstone National Park last fall as an opportunity to make the world my classroom. <laughs> Knowing that I could not bring my students to Yellowstone, I did my best to bring Yellowstone to them. I would like to play one short video that I hope will inspire you to likewise make your classroom walls porous to the world beyond our school. Beyond our school. To the Spanish speakers out there, pardon my couple of ears. <laughs> All right. Aquí quiero mostrarles algo muy impresionante que la vida puede sobrevivir en todos los lugares. Y ahora podemos ver que hay plantas que están creciendo después de no sé cuánto tiempo sin la posibilidad de vida. Este suelo ahora está cambiando y las plantas pueden poner sus raíces en este suelo y crecer. Y es un buen ejemplo de crecimiento de nuestro planeta, que, puede tener, que, de, que tenemos que tener, que tenemos, oh, wow, de, tenemos que tener <ríe> algo uh, muy uh, extremo que puede ocurrir, pero después, después de mucho tiempo, puede regresar y eso me da mucho uh, paz, uh, paz y porque con tiempo el suelo puede curar entonces voy a mover la cámara para que puedan ver un poco más I wonder what that oh, thank you. <laughs> I wonder what that spot looks like today. Knowing that time can heal soil, I like to imagine that even more plants in life have taken root. Dr. Palmer distinguishes a community of truth from classrooms that follow a more hierarchical, objectivist model, where knowledge predominantly flows from omnipotent experts to passive amateurs. 
In reviewing my first year journal for this speech, I came across a quote from a student who I think had clearly experienced much of her education in this model. In an entry titled January 6, 2016, I wrote, I am not reaching Amber. I sense a lot of anger in her. There are glimmers where my sincerity has opened her up a bit, but her, I hate this class, is troubling. She clearly does not care how much I know because she does not know how much I care. Another student, Alejandra, once told me, grades are my food. And I don't want to guess because if I'm wrong, I'll feel dumb. With Amber, unfortunately, I did not form a strong connection. I can only hope that she found another teacher with whom she did resonate and grow. For Alejandra, thankfully, I witnessed her develop through the semester and later recorded her stating, Mr. Sneller, you make us think. You don't tell us what to do. It's kind of weird, but I like it. <laughs> Palmer's ideas evoke critical questions we must mold carefully. To what extent is our classroom a community of truth? To what extent is our classroom following a prescriptive hierarchy? And if we seek a community of truth, how might we build it? As Palmer describes, the process of constructing a community of truth requires leaning into ignorance and remaining indelibly curious. He explains that, clinging to what you already know is the path to an unlived life. So cultivate a beginner's mind. Walk straight into your not knowing and take the risk of failing and falling again and again. Then getting up to learn again and again. That's the, that's the path to a life lived large in the service of love, truth, and justice. I had the great honor to join Parker for a weekend retreat at the end of my first year of teaching. To begin the reflective process, Palmer taught us that we can see our lives as a dance on a Mobius strip, a curiously curved shape that has only one surface. As you trace a finger along the Mobius strip, you discover that the inner and outer regions are but one unified flow. Palmer utilizes this symbol to describe how we can attune to our inner and outer experiences of daily living. This may take the form of identifying the values which drive us as educators and ensuring that we exemplify them in our outer experience. As a second example, life on the Mobius may be expressed when we acknowledge that our inner and outer experiences are incongruent and need rebalancing. In any case, educators who sincerely contemplate these ideas are well on their way to that life, live, to that life brimming with love, truth, and justice. In a similar vein, author, feminist, teacher, and scholar Gloria Jean Watkins asserts that progress toward a vibrant classroom community requires regular mindfulness and self-compassion. Under her pen name, Bell Hooks, she writes that feeling downtrodden in schools often has close connections with oversimplistic binary thinking. She states, there are times when I worry I'm not being a good teacher, and then I find myself struggling to break with the good bad binary. It's more useful for me to think of myself as a progressive teacher who's willing to own both my successes and my failures in the classroom. The vision of teaching that Parker Palmer and Bell Hooks espouse and embody is an approach that simultaneously embodies students and educators. In this ethos, teachers' mindful self-compassion becomes a model of follies, resilience, and growth. Concretely, this may be as simple as widening the classroom web inviting people into our spaces for many walks of life. In doing so, we can live up to Palmer and Hook's ideas and engender growth within our students' lives, both during their time with us and after. Life as we knew it has changed. The snow globe has been vigorously shaken. This turbulence reaches all corners of the globe, yet, we must look forward with some optimism. For more guiding light, we can look to, the, to Viktor Frankl, a survivor of four Nazi concentration camps and author of the world-famous text, Man's Search for Meaning. In 1946, he wrote, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. 
As the COVID pandemic continues, we may sometimes feel helpless, as if our agency has eroded away beneath us. This natural feeling can be met with self-compassion, a commitment to exploring our inner landscapes, and a choosing to focus on our immediate sphere of influence. Just as the soil in Yellowstone can evolve, we too can dig deep and make this school year one of our best yet. When we focus on our personal growth and our collective willpower, we will achieve great things. To that end, I would like to pose a challenge to the group, myself included. Become the author of your life. Imagine new plots, develop fresh characters, and write the story you want to read. Take the 1,000 foot view of your classroom, or the 14,000 foot view. Build a community of truth alongside your students. Dance your life on the Mobius and help the Ambers and the Alejandras become their best selves. In closing, I would like to share a quote by educator, author, media theorist, and cultural critic, Neil Postman. As you listen, I would like for you to think in an active framework of both and, rather than the easy, simplistic binary of either or. At its best, schooling can be about how to make a life which is quite different from how to make a living. In Harrisonburg City Public Schools, we dedicate ourselves to both preparing students to make a healthy living, and we engage with life's greatest questions and greatest knowledge. Our students and community are in good hands. The view looks good from up here. Thank you.